Forrest Gump by Robert Zemeckis is uh, my number four pick. And for those of you wondering why Reservoir Dogs and Forrest Gump are on this list instead of Pulp Fiction, um, I really like Pulp Fiction a lot. Um, it, it's more of an issue of pacing. Um, Pulp Fiction's pretty long and kind of slow in spots, whereas Forrest Gump and Reservoir Dogs both move really well, which is why I like them better. Other than that, it's really, really hard to compare them, especially to Forrest Gump, because they're so different from each other. Additionally, there have been a lot of Pulp Fiction imitators since that movie came out, and not so many of Forrest Gump. It's pretty unique. I like the tone of it. Uh, it's sweet. It's sentimental. It's also kind of it has this sort of mean streak of humor in it, you know, making fun of Forrest and also making fun of a lot of other people. Um, uh, my dad had an interesting point about this movie after it came out, and that is that Forrest is the kind of guy who won't complain about anything. He just deals with whatever's thrown his way, which I thought was pretty cool, actually. Forrest himself is not so cool, um, but it's a very memorable picture. Robert Zemeckis, he directed Back to the Future, my favorite movie of the 80s, and this is one of my favorites by him as well. He also directed What Lies Beneath, which is one of my favorite movies of this decade, so he might get on that top ten list once again. We'll see. Um, number, s number three, ironically, is called Seven. <laughs> now, Seven is at number three because I don't think there has been a, I don't think I have had a more memorable and, 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 and emotionally displacing experience watching a movie in a theater than this one. I couldn't believe what I was seeing, and I actually sat in the theater for 50 minutes after the credits had ended, after the lights came up again, and couldn't move, you know, before finally, you know, getting up to go home. Oh my goodness, this movie is so intense, and so incredibly creepy, and everything about it is so great. It's one of those movies where I wasn't evaluating it when I was watching it, which is what I do all the time now. I evaluate movies as I watch them. You know, it's hard not to just like forget about all that stuff and just enjoy it. I'm always looking at so-and-so is really good at the acting this and I really like that dialogue and that was a good twist and the camera angles are good here and maybe they should have cut that shot or that scene, whatever. I wasn't thinking about any of that stuff during this movie. So intense. And um, David Fincher is now one of my favorite directors. I didn't really care for Benjamin Button that much, but all the other movies he's made, he's made are, are, are terrific. And, but none more so than Seven. It's fantastic. I went to see it six times. That's ironic, isn't it? A movie called Seven I went to see six times. That's a number three on the list. But, you know, anything different than that would be weird. My number two favorite movie is Goodfellas uh, from the 90s by Martin Scorsese. My number one favorite movie from the 90s by Joel and Ethan Cohen is Miller's Crossing. These are both gangster pictures that came out with just a few months of each other came out just, you know, within, you know, just a very short span of time. And the differences are very pronounced. Goodfellas is a realistic gangster picture. It's based on a true story. Miller's Crossing is a romanticized gangster picture that takes place, you know, in the 30s with all the suits and hats and the production design and the Tommy guns and the lingo. The lingo is so amazing. What they have in common is they are both the very best movie by their respective directors. I know all you know Country for Old Men fans, it's Miller's Crossing. Miller's Crossing is the best Coen Brothers movie. For those of you who think that Raging Bull or The Departed is Scorsese's the best movie, uh-uh, it's Goodfellas. Goodfellas is the master, just the master at the top of this game. You've got dual narrators, which he used again in Casino to much less memorable effect. Uh, the editing style is, is really, really great. Um, and at the time, was just totally floored by it. You know, the freeze frames and everything like that is just fantastic. And Miller's Crossing is kind of a mysterious movie. Um, I didn't really love it when I first saw it. I thought it was good, but my fascination with it developed over time. The more I saw it, the more I discovered, the more I figured out what was going on here. And also, Harry Knowles wrote a very good review of it in 2000, sort of a 10, year, 10 years later review of it, um, and uh, it sort of shed additional light on some of the character motivations. Um, they're both terrific. They're both, uh, you know, just the best of their kind, and I love them. I love all these movies. They're so great. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, each one of them is, in its own way, kind of perfect. Uh, so I, they're, they're the standards that I judge all of the movies by practically. That and a few of those 80s movies that are among my favorites. Um, so I hope that this is helpful to you. Um, like I said, I'm doing the best of the decade, uh, of this decade, within the next couple of months. We've only got three months left until the end of this decade. Um, so. And in, in, in that time, I will make a series of videos on exactly how I put together a top 10 list, what I look for, what's important, how it works, 
which may help you in determining which of the 30 movies I've been mentioning over the last several months will be uh, those 10, will be those top 10. So we'll see about that. Thanks very much for watching and uh, talk to you again soon.